without further ado, for Sean So. Hi, uh, I'm Sean. Um, just a bit of background. Um, I started my career at Google um, in the Associate Product Manager um, program. I was there for two years. Uh, after that, I uh, decided to uh, do my own startup, so I started that. Um, we did that for about two and a half years before we uh, got acquired by GoDaddy. So I was there for about two and a half years again. And then I decided to um, uh, join a startup scene again. So um, I actually joined one out here in New York um, called Dresser. Well, it's a still a sort of a, can't hear. Should I move this up? Just speak louder, okay. Um, so I joined uh, the startup called Dresser. It's still in stealth right now, so I can't really talk too much about it, but we're uh, doing um, fashion AI, so. Um, so today the topic is, uh, Product management at big companies versus startups. Um, just quick show of hands, who's uh, working as a product manager right now? Okay, about 15. And uh, big company product manager? And the rest are startup, I'm assuming? Okay. Um, I wanted to talk about four differences today. Um, I have two slides per difference. The first slide will conceptually explain what the difference is, and the second slide uh, will give some examples to elaborate on uh, the concept. Um, we'll go through these, and then after that we can have Q&A session. Um, just a bit of context before I jump into the first difference. Uh, as you know, the roles and responsibilities of a PM depends on many factors. The company size is one factor, um, but you know, the the market, the type of product, the size of your team, whether it's a product or service, um, the seniority of your position, all of that sort of factors into it. So please remember that, keep that in mind as I talk about these uh, differences tonight because I'll be generalizing a bit. So the first difference, um, what I like to call the average flying altitude, 10,000 feet versus one foot. Um, as a product manager, you're expected to fly at different altitudes. And when I say altitude, I'm talking about the granularity of perspective. So uh, at a high altitude, at 10,000 feet, you are operating with this strategic perspective. So especially if you're at a startup, and especially if you're at a pre-product uh, market fit stage startup, um, your day, -to day operation is largely strategic. You're thinking about how to find your fit within the market, you're thinking about um, you know, the, uh, the landscape, how the technologies will shape your landscape in the future, your strategy and goals for the upcoming years. If you're working for a, a large company, you also have to think about other teams' priorities, your company's priorities, all of that. So that's sort of strategic perspective that you have. Um, and you know, that's what I like to call sort of flying high. Uh, at a lower altitude, uh, you're sort of worrying uh, about the intricate details of your product. So it's like the implementation perspective is what you should have. And um, you know, getting the user experience right, the UI, UI right, um, and uh, managing your backlog, fix, fixing your bugs and launching things, all of that is sort of the implementation perspective. So a couple of examples to illustrate my point. Uh, when I was at GoDaddy, I worked on this uh, product called Search Engine Visibility. It was their SEO product. Um, I'm sure you know GoDaddy. You've heard of it. Um, we're very famous for Super Bowl ads um, that we ran a, a number of years ago. Um, we're leaders in uh, domain registration and hosting. Uh, very few people know that we're trying to get into the website builder and digital marketing services as well. I was part of that organization. So the idea is that you buy the domain from GoDaddy, you buy hosting from GoDaddy, but then you would build out your website using GoDaddy technology, and then you would also do digital marketing of your website using GoDaddy technology. So it makes sense. They're trying to provide the end-to-end -end solution for small, medium business owners. Um, and I was pretty excited when I joined this team. I was told that, okay, you're the, you're the owner of the product. You get to your, set your own strategies and goals. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. Um, but then I soon realized that uh, it came with a certain number of sort of constraints. Um, 
you know, there were already company level strategic goals, OKRs. Um, and then even within my department, the website building product was a much larger product. So it was already decided that when all the other smaller digital marketing products would launch, it would be launched as part of the website builder product, it would be an integration into it, which made sense. I was happy about it because as a product manager, I didn't have to really worry about acquiring users after we launched. I already had an on-ramp um, through this product. Um, but regardless of whether I was happy um, or not about that plan, uh, there was not much room for me to fly at a high altitude. There was no, you know, very little room for strategic thinking, if you know what I mean. Now, in contrast, when I was uh, doing my own startup, um, Canary Calendar, this was our third major pivot, by the way. Um, it was a iPhone calendar app with smart uh, scheduling functionality. And as you can imagine, we were, you know, in this constant phase of testing our hypothesis trying to see what sticks uh, you know, in the market, trying to find our fit in the market. And you know, we were actually dreaming of being able to fly at a lower altitude, if that makes sense. Okay? We were sort of dreaming of being able to sort of you know, optimize on metrics instead of sort of constantly thinking about strategic things, finding our market fit, all of that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a bit of a contrast between the big and small companies. Um, one sort of small side note caveat is that um, when I was working for my own startup, I was also coding. I was working as a front-end en an engineer as well. And as you can imagine, if you're an engineer, you're flying very low in terms of you know, your implementation perspective. You're actually building out the product. Um, so I, I, was, I was in a situation where I had to sort of switch back and forth between altitudes, right? So I was like coding, you know, flying very low in terms of altitudes, but then I had to sort of step back and uh, think about where we're going, think about our strategy and fit and all of that. And what I realized um, rather quickly was that if you do that rapidly enough, like you become so inefficient. Like no one, I, I like to think that I'm, I, I wasn't the only person who was uh, incapable of doing this, but in order for you to sort of switch between these modes, uh, it requires a lot of time for you to sort of adjust your perspective. So just, just one tip, if you ever find yourself in a position where you have to sort of switch um, modes like this, um, I would recommend that you don't do it so rapidly, okay? So the second difference is scaffolding size. Uh, fortress versus ladder. Uh, when you build a structure, you need scaffolding. Uh, if you have too little, um, it might be dangerous for you. Um, it might not be efficient for you. Um, if you have too much, then it just becomes a structure of its own, it could get in the way of you building the actual structure, right? So, you know, stating the very obvious, you need just the right amount. Um, generally speaking, at a smaller company, you don't have enough scaffolding, you don't have enough structure. Um, as the company size grows, you tend to have um, some scaffolding um, here and there that you may not need. So when I joined Google for the first time, um, I was really excited, you know, not because you know, of the free food or the certain level of prestige that comes from it, but project management tools, methodologies, uh, testing and release cycle, like those were all established. Like the scaffolding was already complete. Um, clear role definition, they have very clear role definition. So if I had a question, if I, you know, had an issue, I knew exactly whom to go to. Um, they had a very cl clear role definition for product managers, so I knew uh, what I was doing and other people knew what my role was. Um, in contrast, uh, when I joined my current company, Dresser, uh, it's a small startup. Uh, when I first joined, they didn't have any product managers, so they didn't have any of that. Uh, they didn't have an agreed upon project, pro uh, project management tools, methodologies, uh, you know, release cycle, testing cycle, there was all sort of, you know, ad hoc. Um, so, you know, there was an opportunity for me to set something up, but, you know, I found myself in a situation where I had to wear many hats, which is fine, but then I was in this interesting position where I had to sort of justify my own existence. Now, to be fair, like, a product manager has to do that in any organization, I believe, but it was a, it was, it was a sort of an extreme case for me. I think it's partly because we had a lot of people joining from the fashion industry and they weren't really familiar with the, uh, the way we go about building products and they didn't really 
understand what a product manager uh, was for. Uh, but then I had to like really sort of you know carve out you know um, an, an area of sort of expertise and ownership and sort of tell people this is this is why I'm here. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, let me help you do it. So that was a sort of an um, interesting learning that I took away. Um, Caveat here, or side note here, is that uh, there is no one-size-fits-all scaffolding. Um, kind of obvious again, um, but what I mean by that is uh, when I implemented the, uh, the, the agile practice within Dresser, um, I immediately went back to my experience at GoDaddy. We had a really efficiently running Scrum um, implementation at, uh, at GoDaddy with my um, team. So I was like, okay, it worked perfectly with my GoDaddy team. I'll just bring that over to Dresser, and we'll be fine. We did that for about a month or two, and then I realized um, Strum isn't really agile at all. Like that's what I realized. It actually takes a lot of effort and time to implement that and practice that properly. So I realized Strum was just just wrong for us, and that's what I mean by this. There's no one size fits all. So I had to sort of develop a version of that um, that would meet the requirements of our team. Um, we ended up implementing a hybrid model um, um, somewhere between Scrum and um, Kanban, but uh, it's working for us now. Now the third uh, difference is coordination and communication. For the lack of better analogy here, um, I'm using first dates versus weddings. If you guys can think of better analogy, please let me know after the, uh, after the talk. But what I mean by that is, you know, hopefully you're going out on more first dates than you're having weddings in your life, right? Uh, the frequency might be higher, but the level of coordination and communication required to set up first dates is much lower than planning a wedding, right? So startup coordination and communication um, at startups is like setting up first dates. Um, you may need more frequent communication because you're usually flying at a higher altitude. You know, you're having that sort of strategic perspective and that requires more frequent communication and coordination. Um, but that also means that the information size can be small because it's very abstract. Uh, in contrast, at bigger companies, you might not be meeting as frequently, but because you're flying at a lower altitude with all the implementation perspective you have to have on it, all the intricacies of your product details, the information size is big. And a um, couple of examples. So when I was at Google, the meetings would usually be weekly. Uh, when we were leading up to, up to launches, we would have more frequent sync ups for sure, but usually meetings were weekly. And when we would have these meetings, they were very low in abstraction. So the agenda was set prior to the meeting. I would send it out prior to the meeting. We would have the meeting. I would take notes during the meeting. Um, there would be a clear set of action items by the end of the meeting. I would send it out to everyone. Um, and we would all understand, remember, and recall what we talked about in the meeting. It was, it was easy. Well, I should say it was easier. Uh, in contrast, when I was working for my own startup, we had daily coordination. Because remember, we're you know, flying at a high altitude. Things are more abstract. An interesting thing here was that um, I don't know if you've ever found yourself in these situations, but like you, we would talk about an idea. We would talk about. You have a question? Uh, sorry to interrupt. Is Scrum being implemented at Google? Huh? Is Scrum being implemented at Google? So, like, I was at Google uh, seven years ago, uh, and each team had uh, their own versions of um, uh, pro pro project management um, methods. Um, my, my second team did have a version of Scrum, but I can't speak for the entire Google as a company right now. I don't know. I, I, my guess is yes, it has to be. But yeah, I can't. I can't really speak on behalf of them right now. It's, it's been a while. Anyone from Google? No? OK. But, but like, I would bet a lot of money that they are doing a form of Scrum, right? It has to be agile. Um, so, you know, we would talk about an idea, we would talk about a hypothesis that we would uh, test, and we would really, you know, get excited about it. You, you know, when you think of a cool new idea, at first you're like really excited, and then 
you sort of think about it a bit more and then you're like really disappointed. It's, it's not gonna work out. Um, so like we would agree on an idea, we would get excited and then we would walk away, the, the meeting would end. Um, and then we would reconvene after maybe, I don't know, 24 hours, 48 hours. And the interesting finding was that oftentimes these abstract ideas sort of branch out in different directions in different people's minds. By the time you reconvene after 24 to 48 hours, which is not a lot of time, you have completely different versions of these ideas and abstractions. So we realized that and we were like, okay, like we can't operate like this, obviously. And because we were talking about ideas that are so high in abstraction, it didn't really make sense for us to document everything you know, to the extent where it would be crystal clear for everyone. So our answer was that, okay, we need to meet much more frequently. So that's sort of the, the difference. Uh, the caveat here is for you know, big companies, managing up is a huge part of coordination, I'm sure you know. And what I mean by that is, you know, as a PM at bigger companies, uh, carving out sort of um, areas of specialty and ownership for your team uh, and sort of telling the rest of the company and your leadership about what you're doing, your sort of prog progress and achievement, that takes a lot of, a lot of time and coordination. So we, we have to keep that, keep that in mind as well. So that's a difference. Uh, the last difference, uh, team momentum now versus later. Um, when I sort of think about team momentum uh, at a startup, you know, agreeing on an idea or hypothesis that you want to test might be a difficult process, but when you actually agree on something that you want to test, the implementation phase can actually be really enjoyable. Like, it's, it's fun. Like, you're doing your uh, tech startup because you like building things, and when you actually get to build something, it's fun for you. So there's a lot of momentum. But then comes the launch time, and you realize, you know, even if you build it, they won't necessarily come automatically, right? Um, and then you sort of start to lose momentum because you have to sort of really think about how to get users, how to onboard users and everything. Um, compared to that, at bigger companies, you have a lot of sort of internal hoops that you have to go through um, when you try to implement anything, right? Um, but then, you know, in many cases, because you already have a large uh, base of pre-existing users, you have sort of on ramps that you, you can leverage when you launch your features and products. So um, after launch, the momentum tends to be higher. Again, I'm generalizing here. So again, at GoDaddy, when I was working on SCV, we had this one feature. Um, we decided that was a good feature. So we prioritized it, we uh, built it, we tested it, it was ready to go. But then it took us more than a year to launch that thing. Like it was completely ready to go, but it took us more than a year to launch be because it was uh, all the internal constraints that we had to sort of over overcome. Uh, technical integration constraints, uh, legal accounting, we had to meet with them. Uh, there were a lot of sort of politics involved as well, I'm sure, as you can imagine. Uh, resourcing, um, you know, other team that we had to rely on for this launch, you know, their priorities would change, company priorities would change, we would get sort of deprioritized. So we had to wait a year. You know, when we did finally launch this, it was great, the team felt good about it, users were loving it, but, you know, the momentum already sort of, um, the momentum only picked up once we sort of launched. Um, until that point, it was a lot of sort of hassle that we had to sort of go through. Um, you know, as opposed to that, uh, within Canary, I already sort of explained it. Once you sort of decide what you want to build, you know, we had a lot of sort of excitement fun during the sort of implementation phase, but then it would all come crashing down when we launched because we just, you know, we, we realized we had to sort of go out and get users. We would repeat that. Um, so yes, those are basically the four differences. Um, and yeah, again, just keep in mind that, you know, this is generalizing, general, generalization. Um, a lot of factors sort of go into the, the nature of PM work um, and company size is only one of them. Um, I hope you learned something from this. Um, should I take questions now? Yeah.
Yeah. Um, so I guess you know you, you. I probably wouldn't call GoDaddy a startup anymore, especially since they have IPO'd. But they had something like 4,000 employees, and um, um, they weren't an, an, a, 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 an order of magnitude bigger than your startup. It sounds like. So um, as the company grows, and unfortunately, I haven't been in a situation where you know company grew so rapidly it had to sort of change change its way of doing things from uh, you know the the release cycles and uh, project management sort of uh, methodologies and everything. Um, but I would think that there has to be sort of an uh, adaptation uh, period and, and process in place. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I, is there anything specific that you want me to speak uh, to? Um, just like it's definitely an industry choice, it's having a massive demand, which is always true. <laughs> that process is just like you're kind of dealing with like a shortage of crazy smart I would constantly question how much scaffolding, just to use my own analogy here, I would constantly question how much scaffolding you have and whether that is too much or too little for your current situation. Like that's what I would do. Um, if it seems like you know, your CEO is just trying to operate at a pace where it doesn't make sense for the size that you have right now, um, maybe it means you just need a little bit more scaffolding to stabilize everything. Um, if it's the other way around, maybe you need to sort of simplify things. Um, but that's what I would try to concentrate on. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I'm sure a lot of us here are kind of at this session because we're wondering, do we PM at a startup or at a big company? You've done both. Can you speak to, you know, from what kind of personality traits or job satisfaction traits you have to have to be happy, be successful at the big company versus a startup? Like who, who fits better in one versus the other? Which one do you think you fit better in? Um, I'll answer the, the second question first. Uh, I change every two years. Okay. As demonstrated by my pattern of going from Google startup, GoDaddy startup. Right. Um, so I, if you force me to choose one, I, I, I can't. Um, I think you know if you've ever worked for a startup, there is sort of inherent certain level of um, chaos and uncertainty that comes from it. If you're okay with it, like you're gonna have a lot of fun, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, big companies, uh, you know, they do provide stability, um, but unless you're one of the lucky few, you know, two percent of the company you may not be working on the most exciting projects at the company. And if you're okay with that, um, then the stability factor might work out for you. So I think those are, you know, I'm sure there are many, many other differences, but I think stability versus like um, really sort of being excited about the level of impact you might have, I, I think those are sort of the, uh, the, the pros and cons. Um, yeah, uh, and what was the, did I answer your question? Personality traits. Personality traits? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I think risk averseness I think really comes down to that. So, um, have you ever worked for? See, a I'm a, I was at a big company, so I'm I'm actually now kind of trying to decide which going to a big company or a small. Um, did you see anyone you know kind of really fall flat on their face in the startup or or you know, get really bored in a big company? Yeah, for sure, all the time, all the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people people don't really realize that. And and in my case, um, I know I'm gonna get bored after a certain number of years at a big company. And then um, I also know that after a certain number of um, uncertainty at a startup and you know not so high sort of paychecks, mm -hmm. that I'm gonna sort of long for that stability um, and, and and sort of bigger paychecks. So like I I go back and forth, and I've seen that in my friends as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are extreme cases where, you know, some people can't just 
don't sort of manage to um, adapt to the big company lifestyle and then they just sort of quit. Not for the purpose of joining a startup because if they want to work on startups, but just for the, for the purpose of sort of you know, not wanting to do that anymore. Um, there are cases like that. Um, but if I, if I may add, I think if you're uh, a starting PM, um, and this may not be part of your question, so pardon me if I'm just like you know, speaking um, um, additionally here, but uh, I think if you are a starting PM, uh, there's a lot of benefits to starting your career at a bigger company because they have way better structure in helping you sort of grow as a PM to understand what you're supposed to be doing as a PM. Um, if I actually joined my current startup dresser um, as like a, like a sort of a you know, new PM, I think I would be lost. Like there's like no one to handhold me. Like I have to figure everything out. Um, it's just so much chaos there. Um, and certain le level of sort of surety that comes from your leadership um, is affected by the number of years of experience, I, I believe. So you know, working for a big company does provide you with the training. And um, that's what I would recommend anyway, yeah. Yes. How can you cope with the concern that let's say if you were to work in a startup that's not working well and then you kinda have that impression that's not working well and then you have that you know, down feeling and then you're like, Oh, what should I do? You know, how how, how can you deal with that kind of uh good question. Uh do you, you guys have you seen the uh what do they call it, the, the valley of despair or something of despair, the graph? Um, and it goes something like, you know, you're super excited about your startup idea, but then, you know, you implement it, no one's sort of using it, so you just, you know, get depressed. And then slowly, you know, usage picks up, and then if you are a successful startup, you keep growing. Um, exactly, right? So, and it's not like a one dip, you know, you go through this, right? Um, and that's what I mean when I say, you know, you have to be okay with that level of uncertainty. Um, yeah, I think, I think it actually might come down to your personality. I, I'm, I think there are some people who may uh, not choose to sort of go through uh, for the sake of keeping their st stability. Um, I'm not actually sure if that's something that you can sort of work on to improve upon, uh, get better at. Um, but you know, some people are just more okay with um, uncertainty. Uh, they're sort of better at dealing with sort of emotional ups and downs. Um, so I would really sort of ask, you know, introspectively, uh, am I that person? Can I handle that? Um, if the answer is yes, I think startup is the answer for you. But um, have you ever worked at a startup? You'll go, you'll go, you'll go a lot of, uh, I, mean, I mean, like, for me, even, even like throughout the week, you know, on Monday, I, I might be really happy, Tuesday, I might be depressed, right? So, um, I, you, you might get better at it, but I think, uh, I think you really have to sort of decide for yourself if your personality matches the lifestyle um, of a startup, sort of the, the emotional ups and downs um, that will accompany the lifestyle of startups. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I didn't quite understand your, your, your momentum uh, uh, chart. So I, I work at a, a big company, and we, we typically have a customer that we're going to deliver to at, at um, you know, when we reach the launch point. So I, and so I never really worked in an industry where we don't have a customer at, at launch point. I, I, I don't quite understand why the momentum would um, you know, start to go down to a big company. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, that's why I sort of um, said this is generalization. Uh, it probably doesn't work in every situation. But I was, I was saying that the, the chances are that bigger company would have pre-existing customer base that they can tap into. Um, so if you're launching a feature, and if you're able to leverage that, the momentum would be, it'd be easier for the momentum to pick up after launch when compared to the startup situation. Does that answer the question? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to piggyback on that point. Uh, what the big company where you use and uh, I think part of the reason why the, the curve goes up a little bit for big company is because um, we're already thinking operationally, 
in advance before the way in advance before the launch on exactly how which particular use case is going to have a higher adoption rate. Um, so yes, customers are there, but like knowing that what how the momentum is going to pick up, that that kind of thinking already goes in advance. Um, but um, actually, I want to. Based on that, I wanted to ask you a question. Do um, you think that startups are, do you see a trend where startups are starting to embrace uh, the experience of a product manager from a big company and trying to attract that talent so that, as you said, chaos is there. So kind of diffuse the chaos and build a little bit of um, structure. Do you see that kind of trend happening? Um, I, I see that a little bit and I don't know if I still haven't decided if it's the difference between San Francisco and New York, or, or if it's the fact that I'm working for kind of a fashion company, or, you know, we're fashion AI. So, um, but uh, they wanted a product manager without understanding what a product manager would do exactly. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, they wanted more structure, more sort of order, uh, and method to the way they were doing things. That's why they wanted uh, product managers. But I feel like after I joined, I was like, hmm, I, I don't know if they actually know what I'm supposed to be doing. That's why I said I had to sort of carve out my own areas of sort of ownership and expertise, right? But I think um, I, I see the startup scene sort of picking up on uh, the importance of having sort of good product managers to lead the the sort of the strategic decisions of products. So I see more and more sort of roles popping up in that scene as com maybe compared to a few years ago. But that's, that's my sort of perspective. I don't know if that's actually happening. Yeah, so um, you know, we had a big meeting with all the uh, engineering leads, um, myself, the design lead, and our CEO. And we're talking about you know, what um, tools to use, what sort of um, cycle to use. Oh, OK. So sorry. OK, I'll speak up. Yeah. Uh, Okay, the question was uh, um, basically like how, how did I sort of implement the Scrum process um, at Dresser, right? At my current company. Um, and I was explaining that we had to sort of get all the leads together and decide on what tools to use, what the, the release cycle would be, what methodology to use. So as I told you, I, I initially tried to bring over the Scrum process that I used at uh, GoDaddy at a bigger company uh, to Dresser. Um, and it, it didn't work out because um, the number of hours required to make Scrum process work efficiently is not insignificant. Um, and you know, at a startup where things are changing so rapidly, and a lot of t a lot of the time people are just like running around, you know, um, so busy, uh, expecting people, especially the engineering leads, to dedicate three, four hours um, every sprint and really sort of tracking how we're building things was too much. So that's why we decided it's not working. Um, so we decided, okay, so if, 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 it, if not Scrum, what can we do? Uh, we switched over to sort of Kanban process where it was sort of a rolling um, uh, list of um, uh, tasks that we had to complete. But then we, we would still have sort of sprints, like every two weeks we would meet and sort of assess where we are and things like that. That's why I say it was a sort of a hybrid version. Yeah, for a few months, but they had their own. So we had a, you know, we had we had one team that was working on sort of the the, the technology side of it, uh, the other team that was working on the infrastructure. So there was no real need uh, to uh, come up with the process that would uh, involve both teams um, at the time. When I joined, we actually started to need, you know, started to need that process. So that's why I sort of, um, you know, implemented it, implemented a version of it.
So the product design engineering teams understood because they actually come from product backgrounds, right? So I had no issue with my engineering teams, my design teams. Um, but, um, you know, again, we had a lot of people joining us from the fashion industry. I had to sort of, um, you know, explain to them what I'm here, what I'm, why I'm here for, all of that. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so um, in a startup, hopefully you're not talking to the lawyers too much. Like, you, hopefully, you're, <laughs> hopefully you're taking the approach of, um, what do they say, you uh, don't, don't ask for permission, to, uh, ask for forget forgiveness later. I mean, that, at least that seems to be the mantra of, of Silicon Valley and how startups there operate. Oh. Um, when it comes to big companies, uh, the struggle can be real. Like you want to launch something exciting and cool, but legal team might say no, right? So I think it's a compromise, and it's I think it's it's case case by case really. Um, luckily, in my case, like they were like more than willing to sort of help. They were sort of more than willing to understand what we're trying to do. So they really worked with us on that instead of just saying no, it's not going to work. And I think that's very important. Um, just trying to get to the uh, the core of the value proposition. Mm -hmm. That way you might say no to a certain implementation of a solution, but you might have other ideas of getting there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think, I think I really appreciate it when a, when a lawyer that I'm talking to, when a legal department that I'm talking to sort of understands the core of what we're trying to do. So even though when they, you know, they might say no, that, that specific implementation is not going to work for legal reasons, but how about this, right? Um, I've been in situations... Not overstep, not... No, not at, not at all, no. I mean, you know, um, if, if you get offended by that, I, you know, I think you have to sort of change your attitude, I think, as a product manager. But I don't think that's overstepping at all. You're just simply providing an alternative way by which legal constraints will no longer be an issue for the product team, right? So I think that's totally fine. trying to get into product management or um, transition, switch jobs. Um, you mentioned that there's a difference between a uh, product manager at startups and the big company. Uh, how would you think there would be a difference with preparing for those job roles or interviews? Interviews. Um, um, I mean, if you sort of research online and read these PM interview books, um, I think you will notice that uh, some of the companies have very specific ways of testing your PM skills. So like, for example, Google will ask you technical questions, um, I believe, um, it was the case seven years ago. Um, and there are specific sort of types of problem solving questions that certain companies will ask, right? Um, so I would actually uh, prepare specifically for that company, if it's like a well-known big company and you can actually research for that company. Um, startups, uh, not as structured, but you know, a lot of these well-funded startups, they have people coming from these big companies. So they're influenced uh, by the culture of those big companies, right? Mm -hmm. So they will actually know, even if they don't have product managers, the engineers and designers will know how to interview for product managers, or how to interview the potential product managers, right? So I think it's, I think it's really similar. But 
you know, when it comes to startups, you can't really do a lot of research because the chances are, you know, so like when it comes to big companies, if it's a well-known company, I would recommend that you, you do some sort of specific research for that company, sort of PM interviewing um, processes and, and types of questions, but startups, really similar, but I don't think you can sort of specifically prepare for them. Yeah. Yeah? I think going off of that, what about um, product or people who want to be product managers who may not necessarily have technical background? Um, I think Google tends to hire more technical people, but I think, for example, like Amazon, can, you can get in without technical background. Um, what about for those who don't, may, may not have a technical background? Yeah. Um, I read an article that Amazon is hiring all the MBAs in the world, right? Um, I know Google has MBA PM hire programs, so I don't think they will ask technical questions there. So I would look for those roles, um, specific, specific roles that wouldn't require technical background. Um, I, I can't think of any other companies that would actually require you to have a technical background for all their PM positions, like apart from Google. Like Facebook doesn't do that. They do general interviews. Um, can you can you think of what, any? What about for like a startup? Then? Yeah. Um, it obviously, depends on the startup. Um, but do you? And it depends on what product specific products you're working with. Um, did I just answer my own question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the, the 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 the. I mean, so like, I like to think that there are like three different types of PM. You can be a technical PM. You can be a very design oriented PM, and you can be very business oriented, right? Um, you know, there might be more categories, if, you know, depending on how you look at it and who, who's looking at it. But there are opportunities for all three types of PMs, right? Uh, if you want to work at Google, the chances are you might have to n not only have a technical background, but like you, you need a you need a specific degree, I believe, right? Like it's it's not enough for for you to prove that you can code. Like they actually require you to have a, like a technical degree. Um, so like there's very little you can do about that, right? But um, I, I think most other companies don't have the requirements. So I would look for those opportunities. Again, like there are very sort of business oriented and uh, UI and design oriented PM roles. So um, if one of those, if you think you can be one of those, I think uh, I would sort of try to build my skill set towards those opportunities. Can I ask a follow up question? I believe you were a consultant at IBM. Yeah, for like three months before I started. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. Never mind. I was, gonna, I was gonna ask how do you think that experience has aligned uh, it's a very sad story. I don't know if I want to. <laughs> so I joined IBM. So I, I grew up in New Zealand, and it was 2009, right? So all the companies were basically canceling their uh, projects and downsizing uh, because of the, 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 the market crash here. Um, that's when I joined IBM. So like, I joined the company, but they didn't have anything for me to do. I don't know if I should be telling you these guys this. But anyway, like, I, I, I very quickly started looking for another job. That's why I found the, the Google opportunity in the United States. Yes. Um, I remember you said like at one point when you were working at a startup, you had to go the walkthrough and like do coding. Like how did that happen? Like was one of the engineers not good enough for it? No, no, no. I mean that was my own startup, and uh, um, I, 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 I'm an engineer um, by trade. Basically, I have a technical background, so I always intended to code. Um, that's something I wanted to do, so I wasn't forced into the situation. So if I remember correctly, and uh, if there are any strong sort of masters in the room, please correct me if I'm getting this incorrect. Um, product owner is not a position, it's a role. So like no one hires product owners. If they're hiring product owners, there's something wrong with them, in my opinion. Uh, so a product manager is usually the product owner. Um, where it makes sense, they can put the lead engineer in charge of being the product owner. Um, it can be a product project manager that becomes a product owner. But I, I don't believe, at least in terms of how Scrum defines it, product owner is not a sort of separate position, but 
It's sort of the role you take on. Same as the, the Scrum Master. Like you don't hire a separate Scrum Master for your engineering team. Usually the engineering lead becomes a Scrum Master. And you sort of you know, lead your engineering team through your uh, sprints. Right? Uh, product owner, again, should be the person who knows about the product and the market the most, in my opinion. And that usually has to be the product manager, again, in my opinion. If that person is not the product manager, there's, there's something wrong um, with the product manager, in my opinion. Right? So I, I think in most cases, product manager should be the product owner by default. Um, but where you, I don't know, in some cases where that may not make sense, or maybe you don't have a product manager dedicated to your team, it can be someone else. Yeah, basically. So we don't we don't use the term product owner, but um, I'm I'm basically the owner um, of the products. Yeah. So you said you work as a product management manager at your own startup. So how is this like different from your other job experience? How is this like? How does it feel to be a product manager, like to be a product owner and a business owner at the same time? Uh -huh. Do you own a share at the startup, or you just, you just uh, work for it? There, there's, there's equity plan. Mm -hmm. what, what's the question again? I'm sorry. So, does it feel, because uh, I'm, I used to work as a product manager at the startup, mm -hmm. but now I have a business idea, and I want to like, found a startup and start my own business, but at the same time, I want to be working as a product manager at the same time. Business owner and product owner for your own idea. Um, I mean, if you are the founder, by default, you're kind of both to begin with. Um, as you grow and you, as you have more capital and more people to help out, I would delegate to someone else. But um, if your question is, is it possible, my answer would be like, you have no choice, like you have to do it anyway, right? You have to make it possible. Um, so by definition, yes, it should be possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, as your team grows, I would definitely sort of um, try to have sort of specific role requirements for everyone. Does that answer your question? Okay. I, Google had program managers, yes. Okay, so, so where, does, where does product manager fall into that, into that whole picture? Right? So, um, uh, I mean, if it's between those two, definitely the, the engineering team. So I, I, think, I think, like, literally every organization will have different definitions on product manager, program manager, project manager. Um, I think Microsoft actually calls their product managers program managers. Right, that's what I was asking. I think I think at Google, like if you are a um, if you are an owner of a product, then you're a product manager. Um, but if you're without a product, it can be a program, right? It can be, and I'm thinking an example here. But um, if it's not a, a user-facing uh, product per se, like there are product program managers who oversee sort of these initiatives, right? So they may not be working so, and and this is probably case by case too. But in general, they may, may not be uh, working so closely with the engineering team. Not necessarily. But um, by definition, each product manager should have their own sort of engineering team that they're working with, at least at Google. Another Google-specific uh, um, question would be, you are an APM, associate product manager, and there are product managers in the company as well. What do you feel is the difference between the two roles? Uh, so the question was like, what's the difference between APM and the, the normal PMs at Google? 
Um, do you guys know the story of um, how APM program um, came to be? Like, so Marissa Mayer, who was the first uh, uh, a female engineer at Google, um, uh, basically set, set up the APM program. Um, and the, the logic behind it was that they couldn't hire great PMs fast enough as the company was growing. So they decided, what the heck, let's get some you know, college uh, graduates, um, put them through this two-year program and, and see what happens. I think that's how the program started. Um, and they've been doing it ever since. Um, to my surprise, like, we are not treated any differently. Oh. Like, the day you walk in, you're expected to own the product the same way as any other product managers. Mm -hmm. Of course, people will help you. But the idea, at least from, you know, the idea was always, uh, you know, you, 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 you hire the right people, yell at them for two years, and they'll turn you to great product managers. Like, there was the some motivation behind it, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. So um, there's very little difference between. Were you shadowed by a product manager within your, like, your, were you shadowed, or how, how, how did it work? You were in the same position as a No, no shadowing. Manager. They just put me in charge of a thing, and I was, I was, I was doing it. Okay. And I was scared. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, how are we going to start? And if you were to switch from a uh, startup to a big company, like, how much of your skill set would you be like, relevant to people at a big company? Uh, and how much would you be like, refocused to fit the goal of that big company? Right, right. Um, I think my, you know, the perspective, the, uh, the altitude that I talked about, I think that will uh, definitely adjust. Like, I'm flying pretty high these days, um, talking about strategic sort of. Um, perspectives that I have to sort of have on a day-to-day -day basis that will probably go away if I join a really big company. I will have very specific thing, highly likely to be a small part of a product that I will own, right? So um, I will be having sort of more of an implementation perspective. So I think I'll have to sort of readjust myself there. Um, I also talked about sort of having to manage up as a product manager, you know, making sure that your team um, has its own area of specialty and ownership. Like, I think that's a product manager's job to do that for your team in a big company. Also making sure your leaders and the rest of the company is aware of what your team is doing, sort of, you know, telling them about it, bragging about it. I think that's a big part of it. So I think that's something that I have to sort of work on as well. Right. Yeah, I, th I think it's an uh, adjustment for sure, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? One more, question. one, one more? Last one? Um, what do you think are just the most important like, traits with all your experience you know, four different companies? A best PM has the following like, X, Y, and Z traits. This, I probably could give several talks on this topic. Um, let's do this. Have you, and I'm going to butcher this, but um, have you seen uh, this Quora article? Um, and I'm trying to remember who wrote it. I think it was. So go to Quora and literally search for that, um, best traits of PM. And there is a really popular article that uh, keeps popping up at the top um, that lists you know, six to seven different um, traits um, of a great PM. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like I have enough time right now. Which uh, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know if I'm successful just yet, but um, you know, as a product manager, you're supposed to have some of the things, you know, even some of the things that I talked about today, uh, you're supposed to have both you know, uh, the high level perspective um, um, uh, in terms of your product vision, strategy, market, everything, but at the same time, you need to understand sort of intri intricate details. Um, you, uh, you, know, have the ability to, you have to have the ability to sort of communicate um, across your vision to the rest of the team, rest of the company, to your leaders, um, all of that. So the communication is very important. Um, execution, being able to sort of um, launch, um, build, um, preferably on time, that's also important. Uh, there are so many different things. So I would actually uh, recommend that you uh, look it up, because I'm not going to do uh, any justice to that question if I start speaking right now in detail. Yeah. yeah.